Please welcome Ravi Gurumurthy, Vice President, Strategy and Innovation of the International Refugee Committee. You might recognize this painting. It's by the great French-Russian artist Marc Chagall. It's not one of his more famous paintings. It was painted in 1967. But Chagall may well never have lived through the Second World War to paint this piece, but for the work of this man. Varian Fry, a journalist who arrived in Marseille in 1940 on an incredible rescue mission to take Jewish intellectuals, artists, musicians, and rescue them from the clutches of Vichy France and the Nazi collaborators. Varian Fry was a member of the International Rescue Committee, an organization that was convened by Albert Einstein. And when he arrived in Marseille, he had no playbook, he had no guidance, he had to improvise. And what he did was remarkable. He first stored $3,000 in his pocket by his leg. He then forged passports. He smuggled people through a safe house called Airbell, which became the basis of his operations, and then over the Pyrenees and into Spain. What started off as a mission to rescue 200 people ended up in resulting in thousands of people being rescued from Vichy, France. It's that spirit of innovation of risk-taking, of daring, that we need now more than ever before in the humanitarian world. Why? Because 60 million people are displaced around the world, more than at any time since the Second World War. But it's not just the scale of the challenge that is remarkable, it is the different nature of the challenge compared to what it was 20, 30 years ago. First of all, people are not displaced in refugee camps as much as they were. That's the image you probably have in your head of a refugee camp, of a refugee. But the majority of people, 60%, are being displaced into urban centers. 90% of Syrians are uh, sleeping rough, renting houses on the edges of cities, not in camps. And they're not staying for days or weeks or months or even years. They're staying for decades. One estimate is that the average refugee stays for 17 years. And whereas in the past, organizations like the International Rescue Committee could work in these contexts because they were allowed safe passage by the warring nations, today they face the threat of Boko Haram in Niger, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, all of which are targeting humanitarian organizations. But it isn't just the nature of the challenge that is different. It's also that we're learning more about whether humanitarian work is effective. We're starting to evaluate work for the first time in a rigorous way and shining the cold light of science on it. And what you find is that humanitarian practice falls into three categories. First, there are, pro there are problems where we simply do not know what works. We do not know how to improve the skills of adults. We don't know how to reduce intimate partner violence. We don't know how to improve governance in the Congo. We need new solutions. Then there are areas where we've got good ideas. Things are working, they're making a difference, but they're not life-changing for those individuals. So take education. We can take a child who reads at 10 words a minute and maybe improve their reading speed to 20 words a minute but we can't get them to the 60 words a minute they need to be functionally literate in order to learn at the next stage. And then there are the areas where we have great solutions, vaccines, cash transfers, things that make a big difference to people's lives. But what we can't do is get them to work in the most crisis-affected remote contexts where we need them to do, the last mile problem. And what we need is innovation in how they are delivered. And that's what we're here to do at the IRC. We have decided to name a center, the Airbell Center, to evoke the memory of Varian Fry, to try to do new solutions to crisis-affected contexts. 
And how we do that, it's very much borrowing from the best of the private sector and frankly from how evolution works as a whole. We're simply starting new seeds, selecting the best and scaling them. That process of new mutations, selecting the best and growing them is what I think the best of the social innovation sector does and the best of the private sector. So let me tell you how design test scale works in practice. There are 52 million children malnourished today. Just one in 10 of them are being diagnosed and treated. And is it any wonder when Grace here in South Sudan has to travel 25 kilometers with a child on her back through the rain, through dangerous conditions, not once, but eight times to get her full course of treatment. And yet, in Grace's village, a few doors down, is this community health worker. She could potentially help Grace, but she doesn't read, she can't read, she can't write, and she can't count. So the medical tools that are needed to diagnose malnutrition do not work for her. We've set ourselves this challenge. How can we stop Grace having to travel 25 kilometers and instead empower that community health worker so that she can diagnose and treat malnutrition? And what we've done is come up with three solutions. They're not high tech. In fact, they're ultra, ultra low tech. The first is a measuring tape. A measuring tape that has no numbers, that just has colors. And through these four or five gradations, you can diagnose whether a child needs to go to hospital or whether they are now fully recovered. But of course, it's not just a one-off diagnosis, malnutrition. It's about how people change over time. So you need to keep a patient record. And that's what we've done. We've got a patient record that has no letters, yet it can still write down the gender, the sex, the, the age, whether a child is on a medication, and you can see whether the child is recovering and can be discharged or whether they need to be admitted to hospital. And then the third thing is, in order to uh, treat the child, you need to give them some plum peanut, which is basically a, a packet of, of peanut butter-like substance, and this is what helps people recover. This scale has no numbers. It just has some visual symbols to help tell the community health worker how many of these plumping up packets the child needs. And if the child is so uh, low in weight, in the black zone, they have to be admitted to hospital. Malnutrition is one of five big challenges that the IRC is trying to address over the next year. And let me just tell you about three more. In Pakistan, every year, the floods hit and thousands of families are left with nothing. They can survive for maybe one or two weeks on the assets that they may have. But at the moment, it takes six to eight weeks to get cash to those people, and it takes around 46 cents in every dollar to get that money to that person. What we're trying to do is dramatically cut the time and cost of getting cash into emergencies. And our first pilot has already halved the time to get cash to Pakistan. The second area there is education. In Niger, families are fleeing on a daily basis because they're being attacked by Boko Haram. What we're trying to do is work out how can you empower a parent to provide the continuity of learning that they, their children need by giving learning through the mobile phone so that they can continue to teach their children. And finally, employment. For the Syrian refugees fleeing to Jordan, they don't just want cash handouts. They want a chance to contribute. They want a, ca a chance at a job. And while humanitarian practice has generated small numbers of jobs, what we haven't done is generate thousands or tens of thousands. And that's what we're trying to work towards today in Jordan. So what are we learning from all of this work? I think we're learning that innovation, creativity, is paradoxical. You need both the expertise to really, really understand issues, technical expertise, research expertise, but you also need naivety 
to think afresh and look at challenges again. You need the scarcity that is often the spur to innovation in a, in a war zone, but you also need the time and the space to reflect. And you need it to be an inside job, which is why the IRC is doing it, but you also need outsiders to bring in fresh perspectives. And that's where we hope you come in, because we want the Airbell Center that we're launching today to be the safe house for new ideas, to be a place for risk taking and collaboration. And if you want to get in touch with us, engage with us and work with us, please do so. Because our aim over the next year is to try and develop the next generation of Barry and Fries so we can help the next generation of Grace and her family and her children. Thank you very much.